called Legend. Legendary filmmaker. <laughs> Well, welcome, Pat. Thanks for joining us. How not to make a horror movie. Pat Higgins. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, folks. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. I just realised I don't really kind of um, rehearse these very much. I have a vague idea of what I'm going to talk about, and in this case, the presentations go along with it. But I'd kind of got it in my head that I was going to start very downbeat, you know, because it's how not to make a horror movie, and I was going to start with a tale of something gone wrong. But now I've been introduced, I've come out all upbeat, so I'm going to have to, <laughs> I'm going to have to change. I'm going to take it down a notch, and I will tell you a tale, a tale of summer 2006. Now, I don't believe that any film is a charmed shoot. I don't believe that any film has ever existed where everything has gone right. But Hellbride was so close, man. Hellbride was exactly what you'd want. It was textbook. To the point where any time anything looked like it was going to go wrong, it didn't. A, a solution presented itself. Best example being, uh, we had a sequence where we were meant to be shooting... Uh, it was a mocked-up nightclub sequence. We were shooting in a darkened room, uh, cast knew their lines, all this sort of thing. And for one reason or another, because on any micro-budget shoot you forget stuff... I'd forgotten nightclub lighting. I'd just sort of overlooked the fact that actually if this is meant to be a nightclub, probably need some kind of flashing lights, that sort of thing. I'd overlooked that somewhere along the line. And this is how blessed Hellbride was. My leading man, a uh, guy called James Fisher, who's an astonishingly cool actor, uh, turns up in the car and I go out to apologise to him, to, to tell him, you know, all right, we're gonna have we're gonna be half an hour late on this movie because we've got no lighting. I explain the problem to him, and he says my boot's full of nightclub lighting. <laughs> and I said, is it? And he said, yes. And he opened the boot of his car, and it was entirely full of professional nightclub lighting. And that summed up Hellbride. That was exactly how the shoot went. And the thing is that when a shoot is blessed, you begin to feel indestructible. And you begin to think that the worst can never happen, because, hey, man, everything works out. What happened was that on the last day of shooting the main wedding sequence, uh, my director of photography and uh, close friend Al Ronald stood on a cable. Now, standing on a cable, again in itself, isn't something that you think could necessarily derail a shoot. Standing on a cable isn't necessarily the worst thing that could happen. On Hellbride, stepping on a cable was the worst thing that could happen. This was the final day of the wedding sequence. We had all of our full cast, all of our full crew there. For, this was the last day we were going to have everybody there. From this point on, it was all going to be small stuff. Everybody was in full wedding outfits. We had extras. We had all of this sort of stuff. And uh, we were a little bit behind schedule. But we knew it was going to be the last day that we had access to everybody. Uh, and Al accidentally stood on a cable which was going into the HD camera. Now, in 2006, HD cameras weren't something that you could walk into a shop and buy. <laughs> HD cameras weren't something you could walk into a shop and rent. They were something that you had to order. And what happened in the process of stepping on the cable was that the connector in the back of the camera broke. The only ways that the batteries would charge on these cameras was via the camera itself. And so the only way that we could get power into the camera was through this one tiny connection that had broken. And we were left in a situation where we had all of our cast and crew together for the last time. Some of them the next day were flying away. We were going to lose the venue. We knew that we would never, ever be able to get these people back together. All of us stood in the same room. All of us ready to stay till midnight if that's what it took to get the thing shot. No way of getting power from the plug socket into the camera. No way of charging the battery. And no way of getting everybody back together again once this was done. We had six minutes of battery power left <laughs> and around 24 setups required to complete the film and at that point I just had a brainwave I realised we were fucked there was <laughs> absolutely no way out of this situation and I just more or less threw my hands up and thought no that's it I'm done and this will never happen again and I'll wait till the end of the show to tell you what happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the meantime, uh, I will 
Uh, we have a video contribution. We've got, I've been very, very lucky as we go through this. We've had wonderful video contributions from a load of different UK filmmakers. Uh, this one happens to be in the audience uh, at the moment. This is Mr. MJ Dixon, whose movie Legacy of Thorn is playing tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. Um, so make sure that you check that out. But uh, if you don't fancy turning around and asking MJ what his worst experience is and what his advice is, we can play it on the video now, which will probably make things easier. Uh, hi, I'm MJ Dixon and I run Micro Entertainment Group and I have done for the last 10 years and over that time we've, um, you know, we've come across many problems, uh, you come across problems on all sets um, and I think rather than focus on, on, on those problems, uh, I'd, 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 I'd rather hand out a piece because there's going to be a problem on every set that you ever encounter, whether it be a psychotic actor, uh, problems with locations, uh, stunts going wrong, you know, um, but there's one thing that's always going to get out, get you out of it because filmmaking is a problem-solving job. And I think um, three words that all, always get me out of these situations is use your brain. Um, it sounds really simple, but there's always a logical step to solving any problem that you're going to have on a film set. Um, and a lot of people forget that. Um, so I, I hope that helps. Uh, I hope that's good advice. And... Um, Good luck with the talk. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> um, I want to briefly talk about film classification. Uh, it's a bugbear of mine. It's something that I rant about all the time. Uh, and it shouldn't be something that's a problem. It shouldn't be something that could potentially derail a movie. But unfortunately for indie movies nowadays, who have the, where you've got very, very small uh, profit margins, it's, an, it's a very crowded marketplace and it's sometimes very difficult to make stuff happen. Uh, the British Board of Film Classification, who are responsible for giving us the UA... Uh, a? My God, I'm in 1982. <laughs> that says a lot about my mind. Uh, the UPG, 15, 18, and so on. Um, occasionally, they will move the goalposts. Some of you may be aware, some of you may not, uh, that over the last year, the British Board of Film Classification have moved the goalposts regarding additional content that can go onto DVDs which means that uh, the additional stuff, the deleted scenes, the, uh, the sort of behind-the-scenes stuff, all of this thing, that a lot of independent movies kind of depend on to... Um, uh, um, uh, a lot of independent movies depend on in order to shift their film. It's what differentiates it from a, uh, an illegal download or whatever. Uh, and unfortunately, the British Board of Film Classification have moved the goalposts, meaning that... Uh, any additional material, even if it's documentary, even if it's non-fiction, uh, needs to be rated, uh, needs to be of the equivalent content of PG or lower, otherwise it needs to be rated as a separate thing, which basically means that uh, box sets that could go through before, uh, documentaries, if any of you have seen the uh, Video Nasties doc uh, documentaries, fantastic box sets of stuff with loads and loads of extra features, they would not be able to go through now. Because the BBFC have changed the guidelines, they would need to get all the additional content rated per minute, and it's no longer financially viable. So the reason that the classification comes through uh, as a potential nightmare uh, as far as filmmaking goes is that if you have made yourself a little independent movie and decided the way we're going to sell this to the public is with loads and loads of behind-the-scenes stuff, um, on actually in my first movie, Trash House, uh, we've got two hours maybe of behind-the-scenes material, uh, and nowadays that would all have to be rated per minute and that would not have been financially viable which would have meant that the movie would have gone out as a bare bones DVD without all that wonderful supplementary material and then the customers would have been a lot less likely to buy it. Mm. So uh, of course one of the biggest nightmares you can have is making a film and then having no bugger watch it. Uh, and unfortunately due to the changes that the British Board of Film Classification have made in the last year or so it's another notch more difficult mm. for us all. Um, okay, these for tickets. Um, now, <laughs> I said I was going to keep it upbeat and positive, and I will do. Um, I'm generally uh, a very... Uh, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I often hear people say that the film industry is full of dickheads. They're everywhere. They're just, like, lurking like gremlins. Um, and I don't believe that. I think that... I think that fundamentally people can be misunderstood. I think that filmmaking is high pressure and I think that people can sometimes make bad decisions. But I don't necessarily think that makes people bad people. I think that uh, sometimes filmmaking can bring out the dickhead side of people without them being fundamentally um, flawed in some way. Um, and actually in ten years of filmmaking I've met 
dozens and dozens of people who I consider friends and who I would rely on. I generally think that most of the people that you meet are fundamentally decent human beings trying to do whatever job they can under the circumstances that present them. Um, and in fact, in 10 years of filmmaking, I've only actually met two people that I would actually consider to be fundamentally flawed human beings and therefore fit the title of dickheads. Uh, one of the problems with that is that because I am relentlessly upbeat, annoyingly so sometimes, um, <laughs> occasionally I'll be asked about my experiences working with people and I love to be able to say, oh, they're brilliant, oh, they're fantastic. And then occasionally you'll hit one of these things where you think, I genuinely can't bring myself to say that, but I want to say something positive. So I came up with this. Um, if somebody does happen to ask me about, and it's very, very unlikely to happen, because I say in 10 years there's only really two people this applies to, I, I've come up with the line, I don't believe there are bad experiences, there are simply experiences that you can learn from, and I learned a great deal from the experience of working with, and then the person's name, whoever is the dickhead. Um, <laughs> This was a foolproof scheme, and it has only come apart for me once, which was actually in a meeting last year where the guy I was meeting with, he was quite a high up guy, um, had asked, and I trotted out this line, and he said, oh, that's quite... And then by sheer brutal coincidence, the next words out of his mouth were, and what was it like to work with, and the name of the only other person <laughs> on the planet, prompting me to sit there and say, I don't believe there are bad experiences... <laughs> And sounding more like I was taking the piss than anything <laughs> in the earth. But yeah, um, there aren't many of them. There aren't as many as some people would have you believe. Most people out there are fundamentally decent and wonderful. So uh, we always try and give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, oh, and he, uh, while we're on the subject, uh, again, the extras um, uh, are, are wonderful, uh, <laughs> a wonderful unknown commodity. Sometimes you don't necessarily know the folks who may be extras on your movie as well as you may know the actors. Sometimes you won't necessarily have uh, spoken to them all personally before a shoot. Um, and, uh, and occasionally, the reason that there are professional extras, there are reasons that people make you know, a decent wage doing uh, extras work, is because it's a skilled position, just like any other one. Uh, but sometimes on micro-budget movies, you don't necessarily employ someone who is skilled at extra work. You sort of think, well, that looks like an old lady. Old lady, will you sit there? And the old lady will sit there and she'll sign a release, and then she will be your extra. Uh, unfortunately, if you do use the ones that aren't skilled, uh, we did once have a scene that was set in a cafe uh, where we basically we'd, uh, we'd cleared the location with the people who owned the cafe and they basically said to everybody, all right, we're closing now, uh, but if you'd like to stay in the cafe and be in a film, uh, you can be and these are the release forms and whatever and you can just stay and you can hang out. And so this was kind of explained to them when we shot the scene uh, and it was only when I went back and looked through the, uh, the footage that there was one little old lady sitting amongst these extras, staring down the barrel of the camera for every single shot. So we had our two characters in the foreground and this little old lady in the background just sort of really giving it the evil. Uh, and she completely made the entire take unusable. So um, that's my lovely little old lady story. Um, <laughs> uh, this isn't so much a nightmare, just one of the things that I found unusual about uh, low-budget filmmaking, which is that before I'd ever been involved with the production of a DVD or something like that, um, I assumed that a great deal of thought went into these things, much like standing in front of a room full of lovely people. Uh, I assumed that people would at least put a modicum of thought into what they were doing or what they were saying. And it was when I was looking for clips uh, to illustrate different points from this, I found the clip I'm about to play, uh, which is actually me messing around with a rubber puppet in my bedroom. Uh, I found this on my hard drive, on the hard drive, uh, and it was only when I saw it, I thought, I've completely forgotten this, and then I remembered it had actually been commercially released, uh, and that that clip of me playing with a rubber puppet is a hidden feature on Nazi zombie death tales. And I'd completely forgotten about the existence of it. Now, the rubber puppet in question um, looks great in the movie, he, he doesn't necessarily look quite so great in this sequence of me playing with him, but this is one of these forgotten moments that exists only as an Easter egg, uh, but I thought I'd share it with you anyway. Is this on? Mm, right, okay. I'd just like to take this opportunity to complain in the strongest possible terms about my treatment on the latest Death Tales movie. I am a trained actor. And to be reduced to such a 
ridiculous cameo performance, not to mention the fact they hit me with fucking hammers. It's just not on. Oh, here they come. I guess turn this off. Oh, I don't think they will operate the camera with my rudimentary pincers. <laughs> and I, and I, completely, I, I laughed at that clip when I found it, and then I thought, oh my god, that's actually available in shops. Me, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's that one. Um, okay, we've now got uh, another of our, our video submissions from uh, directors who've been kind enough to send us stuff. Um, the uh, guy that we're about to hear from is Jonathan Glendening. Jonathan Glendening directs a movie called 13 Hours, which is a very unconventional werewolf movie, which I thoroughly recommend. Um, he is also the director of Strippers vs. Werewolves, which is a film that I wrote. Uh, well, <laughs> I wrote a film called Strippers vs. Werewolves. A film called Strippers vs. Werewolves is made. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily... Anyway. Um, <laughs> Jonathan Glendening doesn't... Um, He's talking about 13 hours rather than strippers versus whales anyway, so let's just take it from there. Oops. The quirks of independent films with low budgets are such at the mercy of other forces which are necessary and producers enforce them on you, but you have to go along with it, otherwise you won't have a film. One of which was the location. In the screenplay, it's a medium-sized house in the middle of the countryside, you know. But the producers found a fantastic location within the M25 belt, so close for crew and cast, but it was a stately home. The advantage was it was at Long Cross Studios, so it had facilities, but the disadvantage was that it was a stately home and that was not what was written in the screenplay. And so that meant when we went to Long Cross Studios, <laughs> we were looking at this stately home for the first time going, how are we going to fit our screenplay into this massive building? And then come the other provisos of the budget, which is, yay, we've got a stately home, and it's a 17-day schedule, but we're only allowed to film inside the stately home on our budget for the first five days meaning we have another 10 days at least within the studio complex, but without access to the location. The advantage of Long Cross Studios was that it did have um, stages. They weren't sound stages, which was a disadvantage because <laughs> the, the studios is right by a major motorway, which means you get constant sound. But you live with that and you're going to redub the film in post-production, or at least that's what you get told. Um, but it meant that the attic sets had to be built and Will Randall designed these wonderful sets which we shot on but he had more of a challenge than that because because of this stately home location which we were taking full advantage of it had a ballroom and that ballroom was the perfect place to set the finale you know, of the monster fight around the piano in this uh, crumbling ballroom as I've said the disadvantage though was that we only had access to the interior of the stately home for the first five days of the shoot so we were shooting the finale on day five but the monster suits weren't going to be ready for the creatures until the last week of filming by which time we weren't in the stately home Christ, there's so much random shit in here So what Will had to do was he had to recreate on the stage half of the ballroom set. And on day five of filming, we were shooting, for example, left to right, shots reaching Josh, reacting to the monster. Come on, come on! And then... On day 18, the very last day of filming, on the set, we were shooting the right to lefts. Actually, with the monster, though, of the fight. Come on! Come on! Come on! It was a complete headache, but we did it thanks to the storyboards which we'd prepared, and just, 
it was a nightmare. But those are the problems you have when you make low-budget films and you have to split your finale in two, by two weeks in different locations. As I said, that was my friend, the brilliant uh, Jonathan Glendening. Uh, and as you probably gathered from that bit at the end, um, <laughs> uh, 13 Hours got retitled Night Wolf uh, for the American release. Uh, I should definitely have had retitling in here somewhere, but we haven't. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I decided... Uh, once again, in terms of uh, the spirit of positivity, that uh, I was not going to let any kind of negative influences, negative reviews, uh, get me down. Because ultimately, if people watch a movie and they haven't particularly enjoyed it, that's obviously very disappointing for them. Some of them choose to express that in, uh, in fairly negative ways on the internet, but it is certainly one of those things, uh, as a filmmaker, that uh, is... Difficult to get used to. As I think I mentioned on uh, my very first one of these talks, uh, the first time I ever really stared into the, the face of someone, on the, not literally as someone on the internet, uh, but who really, really disliked my film was a review that only consisted of the two words, utter shit. Uh, and it arrived on my birthday. Um, and so, so I've had a gradual process... Um, of of coming to terms with the fact that uh, some people simply don't don't like my films, and so uh, in in that spirit, uh, I thought I, I'd sort of share some of their thoughts, um, maybe while wearing a party hat. I thought that would be um, an appropriate reaction. Um, I think we've got some have we got some jolly music on here somewhere. I think um, these are, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll let you know where these. <laughs> Where these came from in in a minute. Um, let's see if we've got some drums. <laughs> I thought I t wasted my time watching it. I can accept low-budget horror films, but this is quite below my expectations. <laughs> I was utterly unpleased for this trash they are calling Killer Killer. I rate this movie 1 out of 10, but that's only because 1 is the absolute lowest you can go. It deserves a big fat zero. <laughs> Maniacs debating each other in a foul, paint-peeling room. Nothing of interest comes of their banal conversations. <laughs> oh. There we go. <laughs> Weirdly off-putting and remarkably dull. <laughs> It, 
It's a horror comedy gangster romance film that tries to be a bit of everything and fails on every front. <laughs> All in all, it wasn't fun, it wasn't scary, and it wasn't pretty to look at. <laughs> I took a chance on this film, as I'd heard it had an interesting premise and was quite funny. How wrong that recommendation was! This film was terrible! <laughs> Thank you very much, haters. Thank you. <laughs> Now, I'm tempted to leave a hat on for the rest of this, would you? Yeah. No. Yeah. Continuity, you see, otherwise I can't cut that bit out. <laughs> um, okay, uh, from the ridiculous to the sublime, uh, international sales agreements. Uh, again, occasionally I'll throw in bits that are possibly a little bit boring, uh, but they are, for those of you who are filmmakers and those of you who are uh, out there signing deals and such, um, international sales agreements that have, particularly ones that have a 50 50 split. Uh, for every territory everywhere in the world can look quite an enticing project, uh, prospect. If you've just written a movie, uh, you've just made your first movie, the idea of somebody saying, hey, we'll give you a 50-50 split can be really enticing. One of the things that just I would put out there is that usually the small print of these, uh, particularly the American ones, are very cleverly worded in terms of expenses. And if you're not careful, again, there are some wonderful, reliable, incredibly honest uh, sales uh, agents and distributors out there. But if you happen to be unlucky enough to chance upon one of the ones who isn't quite so honest, uh, you may find that the 50-50 split only comes after they have recu uh, recouped their costs. And no matter how many units of your film they sell, the costs grow in accordance. So what you actually receive is a six monthly sales statement that actually shows that although they've made $75,000 uh, from your movie, uh, you are actually further away from ever reaching the point where you receive a single penny than you were before they made that £75,000 or $75,000. Um, it's horrible and it's not illegal. Um, it, is, it is perfectly legal interpretation of the contract. Uh, but it's happened to an awful lot of filmmakers who have assumed that they would make their money back uh, by signing one of these kind of deals uh, if the movie was successful enough to sell a certain number of units and then they've realised that ultimately they're not going to see penny one. So um, it's one to watch out for if people are signing stuff. And as I say, um, that's not to paint everybody with the same brush. There are some incredible distributors out there, uh, but not all of them are necessarily looking for the best interests of filmmakers. Oh, this is my buddy Jim Eves. Um, Jim directed, uh, he's directed a bunch of movies. Uh, Bane, which is fantastic, really recommend Bane. Uh, which is Hammer as well, is a great film. Uh, and uh, I made two movies uh, thus far uh, in the Death Tales series. We made Bordello Death Tales and uh, what was released in this country is Nazi Zombie Death Tales. Um, that retitling thing I mentioned earlier. Um, Jim is one of the other directors who works on the Death Tales films. So uh, he's a really good friend of mine. I really recommend his movies. And he's got some stuff to say about joke shop blood. Hi, my name's Jim. Um, I directed a film called Bane, horror movie. Um, so my uh, micro-budget uh, horror recollection is of when we were shooting Bane. Um, it was October 2008. So Bane's very gory, very bloody horror movie. And um, October 2008... When you're shooting these kind of uh, micro-budget features, Bane's got quite a lot of kind of heavy dialogue-based um, scenes in it, uh, but it's also got these big, massive gore, blood uh, scenes in it. Um, so we were shooting around October. We massively underestimated the amount of blood we were going to use because when you get to these bloody scenes, after having had a whole day of really intense people chatting to each other, when the blood comes out, everyone's happy, the crew's happy, the, the cast are happy because you're just flinging it about, filming it, it looks beautiful on screen, put some more blood, more blood. Uh, unfortunately, we grossly underestimated the amount of blood we'd need and we ran out in October. Um, <clears throat> now, October, obviously, it was right up, up to Halloween that we ran out of fake blood. Um, we were using proper uh, fake film blood, which has got like a detergent in it, so it just washes out easily. And wherever we went, no one had any fake blood. Um, so we ended up, uh, first of all, we tried to make our own, which uh, on the hop wasn't great. We made it out of um, grape juice, I think, and that was sticky and stinky and horrible. 
Um, and then in the end, we resorted to buying joke shop blood. Now the problem with joke shop blood is it's expensive. Um, it's very sticky and stainy and just horrible. So it got to the state where we'd have this uh, joke shop blood be flinging it around everywhere and then the next morning my lead actress she was staying with us she'd come down the stairs and her face would be orange from the night before she'd be like morning I'd be like oh hi oh, shit um so yeah it was it took a lot of scrubbing to get that fake blood uh joke shop blood off of their faces and um the moral of the story i guess is um to think about the time of year you're filming and if you're making a horror movie buy lots and lots of uh film blood not the shit you get in the joke shop Bye. Uh, and uh, another video contribution. Um, this is Mr. Keith Wright. Uh, Keith Wright made a movie called Harold's Going Stiff, which was one of the real kind of cult breakthrough uh, zombie movies with a real difference. Um, it, it was a real kind of festival favourite and uh, really kind of established Keith's name. Um, I'd also like to just recommend people check out his new project, Chuffing Hell. Um, <laughs> which he's currently, uh, I don't think production's actually started for that yet, but there's an awful lot of um, sort of social media and stuff that you can go out and check out for Chuffing Hell. So, over to Keith. When you're making a low-budget film, there are lots of things that can go wrong. Um, on Harold's Going Stiff, we shot for nine days, only nine days. The film cost about ten grand. Obviously, cost a lot more in time and effort from everyone. But um, one of the biggest problems we had was uh, with the casting, and it was completely my fault um, because we'd cast someone who was a non-professional actor, uh, which I quite like doing because often you try and find people who are very close to your the characters in the script, and you get a much more naturalistic performance. But on this particular occasion, we'd cast someone who worked really well when we did a um, like a little test shoot with them. And then when they turned up on the day and we put the lights on and the, and the boom was in their face and the camera was in their face and there was crew here, makeup artist here, uh, it, it just completely changed the, the environment and they completely buckled. And uh, we quickly realised after five minutes of shooting that we, we couldn't use them, you know? And um, that was completely my fault. So we lost a lot of time shooting um, and we had to cast someone else um, and that person turned out not to be quite right and so we had to recast and, and it was an absolute nightmare and when you're shooting with on such a small budget you can't really afford to be losing that much time so that was a nightmare for us. I think in terms of advice there's, there's a couple of things I would say. The first thing is try and be original with your story. Uh, Particularly if you're doing horror, because there's so much out there already now. You kind of you're in the marketplace. You're 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 really fighting against a lot of product. So you've got to really stand out if you want to uh, stand any chance of getting distributed or or people being interested in seeing your film. So if you are going to do another zombie film, try and make it original in some way. Don't just shoot zombies in your back garden screaming. Well, you can, but you know it may not stand out. So. That's the thing, he's trying to find an original approach. Uh, I think that's what helped with Harold's going stiff, is that we, uh, we really got noticed because we tried to be a di bit different. Don't get obsessed with the technical. Don't think that, you know, because you've got a camera that can shoot 4K, that's going to make up for a bad script. It's not. The script is always important. The performance is always important. Uh, and those really, those two things, the script and your actors, are the two things that are going to sell your film above anything else. Um, and just because you shoot 4K, it's not going to make any difference. Okay, um, yeah, check out Keith's work, as I said. And I think now I'm going to hand over for a few minutes to my colleague Paul Cousins. If you could give him a hand, please, folks. Good afternoon. Um, if you've seen any of Pat's previous shows, you'll know that he likes to set me rather time-sensitive challenges during these things. Thankfully, I'm not doing one of those this time around. Um, but it meant that when he came to me last summer uh, with the idea of doing an actual project, something that had some meat on his bones, I got very, very excited. Um, the plan was to take Trash House, Pat's first movie, and then considering the amount of time that's passed since he made that look at the technological developments and the amount of the skills and experience he's learned from lessons that he's going through now, 
and see if we can apply that to remake Trash House for less money um, in a bit more of a tighter schedule and make something that looks um, better than it did however many years ago. What did you say? How many years is it? Ten years ago. Ten years ago. Um, now, having seen Trash House, I knew that it was ambitious for a micro-budget film anyway, so re reducing the budget uh, would invariably require some stuff to be cut. Well, and then when I saw the script and realised he hadn't cut anything, that it still had um, a large location that was all, although it was one location, it had multiple rooms, and those rooms were supposed to change at the whim of the characters' imaginations, that it wasn't a two-hander or a one-person in a siege environment. It was a cast of six or seven characters, all with something very important to do that there was going to be uh, a vast array of various monsters involved, that there were going to be fist fights, sword fights, gun fights, and a battle at the end which had three people face off against an army of zombies and an exploding house, all done on no budget, uh, in what was eventually decided to be a 25-minute short, it was going to be a very ambitious but exciting project. Um, as we then started to see the kind of cast come together, and it's going to be a kind of super group of Pat's past uh, actors, and a few new ones who would really impress us with showreels. Um, and then when we started to get uh, the crew assembled, um, that included a lot of, again, Pat's regular, but also people, uh, established directors like MJ, like Al Ronald, who had, um, you know, accomplished directors in their own right, who were going to be coming and crewing with us, bringing their own expertise, their own experience, and thankfully their own equipment, um, <laughs> meant that uh, this was going to be really, really exciting as well. Um, we knew we wouldn't have any money. And approaching the shoot, we knew that there were still a few things not 100% in place, as they always are. Um, even the location, there was a choice of two right up until the last kind of week. And then Pat eventually settled on a really, really good one. So despite all that, um, we felt like we had everything in place to make what would be a very challenging, but um, a very challenging film. And it would be a very challenging, but ultimately rewarding week's worth of shooting. Only we weren't going to have a week. We had nine hours. Nine hours to shoot the film I just described. 25 minutes, zombies, fights, exploding houses, special effect shots, multiple casts in nine hours. Um, <coughs> so time, once again, became very sensitive. Now, I'm a very big believer that uh, time is an undervalued commodity in filmmaking. Money, you can throw... There's only so much money you can throw at a project. You can never have enough time. And time when you start chipping that away, can affect everything. I had at the start of this project what we thought were three really strong things to make, if not the most uh, uh, dramatically um, accomplished film, but we had a really cool location that we finally settled on. looked great, had loads of rooms, and we had it for the duration of the shoot. We had um, the materials and know-how to produce some, not necessarily technically great, but some really interesting and fun on-screen monsters. Um, and we had an arsenal of cameras, rigs, lights and the people to use them. But with the introduction of that lack of time in, those things can even be affected. Let me show you how. Location was great, but it was kind of like one of those old BBC sound effects tapes titled Sounds to Fuck Off Directors. <laughs> we had generators, pipes, heaters, all humming inconsistent tones throughout every single shot. We had a vast array of interesting avian bastards chirping <laughs> and clucking in a cacophony that was so loud it would penetrate Victorian brick. We had uh, loads of great cameras, but when you're up against the time, you stop checking shots. 
which means that you're handing cameras off to everyone, okay? You're grabbing cameras yourself and you're going for it and what passes it that was that shot okay is basically a thumbs up across the room and you move on. It's not until you get home that you realize that everyone has a different interpretation of what a medium close-up is because everyone sees a shot differently. Doesn't matter of the, of the skill that person has, the experience, communicating how clearly you want something framed or making sure that every little detail, that's what I want in camera, that's what I'm not want in camera, doesn't always come across when you're shouting it over a live band playing next door. Okay? <laughs> um, but you don't have time to check shots. So plugging a monitor in, small, big, whatever, um, allows you to check those shots as you're recording them. And if you're ever gonna use a GoPro, Wi-Fi that shit to a laptop. Those lenses are wider than you think. Um, moving stuff to the side does not help. It needs to be gone completely. Now, all those things are ways not to make a good horror film. None of them are reasons not to make a good horror film. Um, had we not have made that, we would not have got to work with loads of really cool people. Uh, had we not have made that, we would not have worked with those new actors and actresses, ones that you normally take a chance on based on a Vimeo showreel, and then when they turn up, as we've heard, they can be slightly less um, cooperative. Um, in this case, we had none of those problems. We had awesome people uh, who were really focused. And if they, you know, on a day shoot like this, if, they, if there is a problem, you can live with that. If you've committed to work for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, then it becomes a massive problem. We had loads of fun on this shoot. And sometimes that's uh, just as important as anything else, actually enjoying yourself. That's why most of us pick these cameras up in the first place. We also um, got to learn lots of lessons. But more than that, um, we actually got to make The Legend of Lucy Sweet. Attention, citizens of the trash house. Playing my game by my rules. And my rules can get quite nasty. So that was nine hour shoot and about 10 hours of post. That's including the score being written and applied to it. The actors had to script about two days before shooting. So that's a 25 minute, big splatter movie with lots of visual effects um, done in 20 hours. Now I'm not here to say that you don't need time. We all need time. I'm not here to say that the advice is to get yourself more time because you're not in control of that. You don't get really a say in that. And actually, let's be fair, None of it. There is no time in the world to run around with cameras chasing zombies. Okay, the, the, the grand scheme of things hasn't factored that, in, factored that in for any of us. We have to make that time. So, what am I here to say? What's my contribution? Well, really, is what are the reasons you're not making that film? Okay. Now, you might have some money put aside. You might have a one-time location that you've got for a certain amount of time. You might have some favours that you need to call in. You might have some cast arranged. And you might not be ready. One thing might not in place that you don't want to put those things into operation and therefore use them up or jeopardise them. So don't. We knew we didn't have any money. That was a choice. It means that we couldn't lose any money. So we could actually just experiment and play and see what happened. It took the pressure off. So you might make a version <coughs> that you've recast with lesser known actors just to try them out. You might have a version that you haven't spent any money on. Why would you do that? Because in today's uh, kind of, uh, with today's technology, it's faster and more productive to shoot your movie than it is to storyboard it. So why turn up to set with some shitty stick men when you can have a tablet or a phone with a pre-cut version of your film with all the beats, all the shots already in place? It might be something only your crew see. It might be something only you see. It might be an online or DVD extra. It might come out well and you might be able to release it. Even if it's just <coughs> your friends in your living room in their casual clothes running lines where you're grabbing shots on the smartphone, you will learn something about your film. Your film will be better for having done that and you will have fun. And that fun will come at probably at a time when you're starting to doubt your project, when you're starting to worry whether it'll ever happen, whether you're starting to worry whether this other idea is probably better and you should leave this other one alone. And it will remind you of why you picked these cameras up in the first place. 
So my advice, as broad as it is, is the best way not to make a horror film is to not make a horror film. <laughs> Everyone here that's screening stuff has made a horror film. That step put them on the path to get here. Okay? They all compromise something to put their things in production. There's no reason any of you shouldn't. So if you've got a horror film, even if it's just an idea, even if you haven't got anything in place, shoot it by the end of the month on whatever you can get hold of. It will all benefit from it. Okay? We did, and we got a pretty cool short that's online now. Okay? Thank you. Legend of Lucy Sweet, uh, again, uh, I won't talk about it much because I think Paul's kind of summed it up uh, brilliantly, but it was an amazing experience to collaborate with that many people who all knew what they were doing. It was awesome. It was really, really cool. At some points we had like three units running. It was basically, you grab that camera and run out there and you shoot that and you do this and you do that. Uh, and we had incredible, wonderful people to work with and it was a really, really great experience. Okay, uh, M's for meat. Now, um, I, I mentioned... The show last year was called um, Fake Blood, Real Guts. Uh, and in the opening of it, I mentioned the fact that we had, on one occasion, used um, meat uh, instead of plastic uh, guts. Um, don't, don't, don't ever, don't, please don't. Um, the smell um, of the location after we had pelted our vegan leading lady um, <laughs> sorry um, with, with, with guts um, it was it's astonishing it will be with I, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and the smell is still in my nostrils because even if you think it's just sausages and liver it'll be fine um, the smell of it begins to permeate every item of clothing every wall uh, oh my god anyway this is uh, this is a horrible flashback uh, for 10 years ago uh, which is basically my crew um, on Trash House uh, my first movie utilising meat never ever utilise meat this is just too much. We've gone too far. It needs to actually come down. That's more chesty than gutty. Oh, that tickles. I mean, I don't know if the... Jamie, you're a fucking superstar. Oh, man, that looks really good. You have to eat... You have to get your head in there and chew it. Oh, that's You have to go in there and chew it. Absolutely vile. Hang on, you're brilliant. Hang on. I could get a job on casualty. <laughs> He's still breathing. Put his guts yeah, back in. <laughs> Can you Ready? save him? Um, I don't know. I don't know where this goes. <laughs> I think I'd do it with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, oh it's yeah. like your own baby. <laughs> That's it. Can you keep spinning your stomach in and out? Unless it's a strange person. Oh, okay, go on then. It's all over my head. <laughs> So uh, Amber, if I could apologise to you through the screen, I'm very sorry. But yeah, don't ever use me. So hopefully um, I've righted the wrong that I did those dear people. Uh, don't ever use me on a set. Um, also, if you want to shoot something at night, please shoot something at night. Um, this is a screen grab from Hellbride. As we mentioned, you know, Hellbride generally uh, was a very, very happy shoot. This is a day for night sequence um, where you can notice the uh, reflection 
of the daylight streaming in through the closed curtains in that clock there. The kind of room tone that we've got there is this kind of muddy beige where you can't really see anybody's faces. Doesn't look like night, just looks like appalling fucking lighting. <laughs> um, so yeah, generally, if you can shoot at night, shoot at night. Um, and also... Um, now, this is, this is meant to be a note about don't let your own personal obsessions overtake a project. I, unfortunately, uh, as a film fan, am incredibly preoccupied with giant octopuses. Now, this doesn't sit well with my role as a micro-budget filmmaker who does not have the facilities to make films that involve giant octopuses, really. Uh, but it keeps creeping through into my work, and I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I kind of try to pop that zit of um, obsession by shooting a fake trailer, which this, <laughs> again, in terms of the great things that we dick around with that then get commercially released, this is on Bordello Death Toast. Bordello Death Toast has got this uh, as a trailer on it. This, again, is not necessarily an example of our finest work, uh, but it was certainly an opportunity for me to visit the genre of giant octopus movies without there being any pressure of making it <laughs> realistic or... Um, Oh, sorry, I'll just play it anyway. <laughs> Cephalopods, octopus, cuttlefish, squid. I'm talking about a plague. I'm talking about little ones that jump down your throat and strangle you from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about really disturbingly big ones, but I'm also talking about really fucking massive ones. <laughs> Phone her, call her, the one woman in all the world who can save us from these sucker-covered motherfuckers. Call the Squid Slayer. An octopus killed my father, you know. <laughs> I see. Now I know why you're so pissed off with them. Jack? Jack? What's that tentacles? I swear on oath. Die, you tentacles, son of a bitch! On solemn oath, whenever the world is under attack by giant squid or giant octopuses, I'll defend it. Whenever tentacled sea creatures threaten our way of life. I'll be there to stop them. How? How will you stop them? By shooting them. I see. So uh, if anybody ever out there does actually want to offer me millions and millions to make a fantastic giant squid movie, I'd be really all over that. But in the meantime, that is, that's all I have to go on. Um, okay, uh, this is another of our video contributions. Uh, this is Jason Impey, who's another veteran of the low-budget scene. Uh, he's made absolutely loads and loads and loads and loads of features of varying um, uh, availability. Some of them have had uh, mainstream DVD releases. Some of them are quite hard to get hold of. Uh, but he's been in the business a very long time. Um, and uh, here's his words about Problem Cast and Crew. Over the last 10 years as a filmmaker of quite a few features and shorts, I think one of the honest biggest problems I've encountered is actually um, a trust issue with people. It's finding the right people to work with. A few times I have actually ended up working with not the best of people and as a result there's been like a bad scene in a group and they have caused so many problems on a particular shoot and the problems have escalated so much that it has in the past nearly destroyed my productions. Fortunately, I've managed to get around them, but it has made me a lot more weary of who I trust and who I choose to work with. So it's great to collaborate and it's great to work as a team, but I think it's very important to find the right team and, and group of people to work with because it only takes one bad seed to, to destroy the whole production. Um, I have many good stories and many fun times of filmmaking, but... I've had a few nightmares and a few um, moments that have really tested my passion for the industry. Uh, my, to be honest, 
if I can sort my locations and my cast out, I find everything else falls into place. I believe this day and age, and advice to people that anyone can pick up a camera phone now, or, or it's very easy to get technology to make films, and I do encourage people to do it, and I think it's great to go and make your own stuff. If you can seriously now, a few people that are willing to be in and help you and, and start you off and find a few locations that are, are great, then I, I think the rest of it can have been great fun and it'll all fall into place for you. Just finding the right people and locations do help. I have had many a pains with finding the right location. Again, probably my second biggest nightmare after um, certain cast members and, and crew and, and bad seats is locations. <laughs> Once I've got my location sorted, I can relax. Getting the right location has again caused me a massive headache and, and nearly cost uh, productions, but fortunately it all works out in the end. Now, um, Cue the Winged Serpent has absolutely nothing to do with this whatsoever. Um, <laughs> this actually is only there because I was sitting with this part of the uh, presentation thing and Paul said, have you got something for Q yet? And I said, no. And he said, what about Q the Winged Serpent? That would really fuck up a shoot. And I thought, yes, actually, the arrival of Q the Winged Serpent <laughs> would really fuck up a shoot. And that's why, that's why he's there today. But we'll move on now. Um, <laughs> uh, the wonderful Danny Thompson, who is also here today, um, will now say a few words via the medium of video about serial column. What's the biggest disaster that's happened while making a movie? Well, um, <laughs> Serial Caller is actually pretty much one great big disaster. Um, <laughs> we'd worked really, really hard on our script, making sure there was no continuity errors and everything worked, everything flowed. And um, we went in and our script was completely rewritten by, um, shall we say, higher powers. Um, and I tried to explain why things were happening. I mean, the middle part of Serial Caller is basically me walking around doing not a great deal. Um, in our original script, I was walking around, I was finding bodies, and the higher power was like, well, no, you can't do that. You can't find bodies, because then you just call the police. And I'm like, okay, it's a horror movie. There's rules, you know? I mean, I'd written in the script that the phones were taken. You could see it all happen. And he was like, oh, no, no. Well, if you didn't have a phone, you would just leave the building. So I was like, well, okay, well, she also tries to go and do that, the character Tanya, she tries to leave the building, she goes to the lift, the killer's there. And he's like, oh, no, 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 we won't have that. We'll, uh, we'll just have you wandering around, you won't find anyone, and at the end we'll have a whole big pile of bodies. Which, um, yeah, I just left the middle of the script kind of a bit like, nah. So, um, I mean, it was a massive learning curve. I'm glad we made it. It's not how we wanted it, it's not our original idea. And as much as I hate rewrites, I would actually love to remake Serial Caller with my original script. <laughs> you live, you learn. And Danny, you've got another film in the festival, I believe. When's that on? Uh, this evening at 5.30. This evening at 5.30, which one's that one? Axe to Grind. Axe to Grind, fantastic. Danny Thompson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, oh, another bit from Keith Wright we've got in sound. Sounds a bugbear for an awful lot of people. Uh, and here, Keith, we'll talk about it. Another thing is to try and get a sound recordist on board, a really good sound recordist. If it's the one thing that you're going to spend money on, get a sound recordist. Don't use a crappy camera mic like I think I'm, I'm using one now, but because I'm so close, it may be fine. But don't do it, because uh, when you get into your mix and you're trying to cut out all that background noise, cars whizzing by, whatever, it's just you'll spend so much time trying to fix the sound you're just better off getting someone who records good sounds so that's another tip another tip shoot for the edit always shoot for the edit so rather than doing eight takes on a wide shot do four takes on a wide shot and do four takes on a mid or a close-up shot give yourself some uh, options in the edit don't get too precious about it because you can you know you can chop it around you can make it chances are it'll completely change when you get to the edit anyway so give yourself choices in the edit and another one, and this one's one that I've learned recently. If you feel like you've got something special on your hands and you're really happy with what you've got, don't give it to a distributor. Do your own distribution. Find a way to get it out of there. There's so many platforms now, and video on demand and streaming are, are becoming big players now in the households around the UK. So, you know, look at Vimeo on demand, VHX, uh, Real House, all those ways to get your. Uh, Distrify is another one. There are all ways that you can get your film out there. 
And if you can spend a bit of time on marketing and finding your uh, your audience and building that early before you even shoot, um, then you'll there's you've got more chance of making some money back. Final tip: make sure you feed your crew well and look after them. Um, treat them with respect. Enjoy it, you know. You're making a movie. People enjoy getting together, making stuff. Don't take it too serious, you know. Be relaxed about it. If things go wrong, things will go wrong. Take it in your stride, you know. Everyone's working together. Sit down, have a cup of tea and enjoy it. Okay, um, I asked for uh, filmmakers to tweet me uh, as well with their own uh, worst experiences. Didn't have very many, um, but uh, I think... I got this kind of intriguing one um, from uh, Andy Ward, who uh, is a lovely filmmaker, made a movie called uh, Evil Bread that played here, I think, last year. Um, and Andy, Andy tweeted me to say he was going to tell me the story. And then he tweeted me again and said, so my story was deemed by my wife to be not very dramatic. And if anything, the Evil Bread shoot was drama free. She's right, I guess. And so, so I thought, oh, I'm never going to hear Andy's story. But he did then later... Um, Send me the tweet. So I did actually get to hear what the story was that uh, his wife wasn't thought was, didn't think was so dramatic. Um, so I'll read that after a couple of other ones. Um, I had a, a tweet from Improbs Drive saying, uh, travelling to Elephant and Castle to pick up fake glass bottles and then travelling to Southend without breaking it. Yeah, okay, travelling in cars, breakable stuff, definitely. Um, uh, a tweet uh, from Kurt Rutter, that's at sign Kurt, um, Kurt underscore Rutter, uh, being stopped by the police whilst transporting guns and body parts <laughs> in the back. Thankfully convinced they were fake. Scary. Um, yeah, I actually, um, I'd completely forgotten until I got that, that tweet from Kurt. Um, after Trash House, we had this blood-soaked carpet that, of course, smelt of meat, as I've explained. Um, and we were driving around with that rolled up in the back of the car <laughs> for quite a while. And again, that a rolled up carpet covered in blood is even worse than one <laughs> that's actually in situ. Because it, it has this connotation of guilt to it. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> lastly on the tweets, I will now get to Andy Ward's story uh, that his wife did not dramatic enough. My story. We stuck an actor's head in a toilet. It went well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay Uh, every now and again you just get some really really left field shit that you really can't deal with Um, the the shoot of ours that uh, was most prone to this was Killer Killer now um, I'm not a um, uh, a superstitious kind of dude Uh, I'm you know I Good luck to you if you are. I'm not. I'm not someone who believes in ghosts. I'm not someone who believes in spirits. I'm not someone who generally uh, kind of goes for this kind of stuff. However, the location that we were filming Killer Killer in, which was uh, Worley Hospital, um, which has now been demolished, turned into luxury flats. It's a building that had an interesting history uh, and a lot of the darker, murky parts of it. Uh, luckily, <laughs> luckily, one of our cast used to work there. Um, and so he knew all these stories and he freaked us out with them uh, gradually throughout the shoot. However, as I say, as someone who's never experienced anything remotely creepy in any kind of... That building after a few days really started to get to me. Uh, and there were a couple of points where... Well, I'll, I'll play the clip. Second thing I've heard noise that I didn't like over there today. Really, really didn't like it at all. And I, well, it was it was like something. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we In what what when was that? Yeah, it was just that one through there. I really didn't like that. So we heard those footsteps earlier today that were really bizarre. That was four footsteps. Well, when we were the only people, we were absolutely hand on heart the only people here. Unless it was OJ, but I don't think it could have been. Well, no, because they stopped and, was, and then there was no yeah, yeah, because that? you went to That's see the it. Yeah. Because I actually, you know, I left to go and look who it was, because you could clearly hear it in the wind, in the, just further yeah. down. Yeah, we were standing waiting to see who it, turned it up. sounded like yeah. someone was just about to come through the door. And everybody heard it. And where were you? We were in the, the first ward, you know, where the, the production where office is. Yeah. We were just standing waiting and ready to take the shot and we could hear footsteps, so we were like, who is that? And just waiting for them to come in so we could say, get out of the way, and we waited and waited and it got closer and then it stopped. <laughs> like, we better go see who it is because we're going to do a tracking shot. 
and then there was nothing. And there's no other way out of there. No, absolutely not. And it's the fact that footsteps can't get louder and then stop yeah. unless the person's just standing there. Because at some point they've then got to fuck off again and get quieter. So. <laughs> <laughs> Unless their shoes fell off. Mm. Um, and they floated up to the sea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. Yes. Okay, um, Warley was a weird, weird place to shoot. Uh, I've never quite experienced anything um, like it before or after. Um, All right, allow me to interrupt myself for a minute to uh, point out what you may have noticed, which is. At this point in the presentation, things are beginning to get a little bit fucking dark. And I don't mean tonally, I mean in terms of you can't see a damn thing that's going on. Now, funnily enough, I meant to include a section in the show about losing light and about relying on daylight, which was exactly what we were doing during this particular version of the live show. Um, when we started, we had beautiful sunlight streaming in through the windows. By the time we had finished, it was, as you can see, pretty damn dark. Now the thing is, I liked this version of the show and this was the one I wanted to put out there. My excuse incidentally is that I did stand up for a bunch of years and I kind of got used to looking up dark audiences. I genuinely did not notice that I could no longer see a fucking thing, which is sort of heartbreaking but sort of apt for this particular show. So enjoy the end of it as it proceeds to get darker and darker. Okay, uh, just a few words about uh, if you're ever shooting. If anyone ever asks you to shoot a period movie, don't! Just don't. Just don't. If someone says to you, we're going to set this movie in the 40s, it'll be fine. It won't be fucking fine! Don't do it! Um, never, ever try and shoot a movie that is set in a different time frame, especially if you have no damn money. Um, Battlefield Death Tales uh, released... Zombie, no, Nazi zombie death tales in this country. Uh, but originally, the, the artist formerly known as Battlefield Death Tales was a movie set uh, in, obviously, in World War II. Um, and we had to try and put together a micro-budget movie uh, that reflected the time um, when we really did not have uh, the <laughs> abilities to do so. Um, the thing that I find quite interesting is that online... Various people are uh, very, very quick to, to... Even though we start the movie with an apology now. There is a written apology on the screen saying, you know, if you're looking for kind of historical accuracy, um, this is the wrong one. You know, you're sitting in the wrong place. Really sorry history. Um, no one seems to mind the zombies, but people seem to mind the wrong rifle or the wrong helmet or whatever. But again, no one minds the zombies, no one minds the demon spies, no one minds the fucking mobile phone lying on the floor in that particular shop. But they're very, very quick to tell you on the costumes. So yeah, just don't do it. Um, just set everything now uh, and that'll be fine. Um, and my buddy Al Ronald, uh, he who trod on that cable that we will get back to in a minute, um, he also made a awesome, awesome movie called Jesus vs. the Messiah. He's not just my director of photography, he's an astonishing director in his own right. Did, uh, both the Dead Tales movies have got a segment from him as well. Um, Jesus vs. the Messiah is an astonishing flick, and it's, uh, it's been a bit of a lost movie for a while, but it's coming out through Cine Demand uh, very, very soon, and um, please check it out. As you can tell from this little clip, um, Al had some interesting stuff to cope with on that shoot. Hello, I'm Alan Ronald. Uh, there's lots that you can't control when you're making a film, but uh, the one thing you definitely can't control is the weather, which we found out when we were on location shooting Jesus vs. the Messiah, and it rained a little bit. Well, we've arrived on our location. And as you can see... <laughs> oh wait, it's gone off. <laughs> No, there it is. Oh yeah. That's fabulous. There you go, you can see the wind. <laughs> F weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and also explosions. Uh, now, explosion, this isn't luckily a tragic story of an explosion gone wrong. It is, though, uh, it's just a cautionary thing. Even when you have, and I'd never, ever, ever mess with explosions unless you have people who know exactly what the hell they're doing, even with those people who know exactly what the hell they're doing, they can still be slightly terrifying. Um, 
this again, this is some uh, behind the scenes footage from Battlefield Death Tales, uh, whereby uh, we, we kind of made the, the most of, because we knew we were going to have shit blowing up and we knew that we were going to have this, this kind of battle scene, what we actually did was uh, we set it up so that I was filming uh, my cast, including Paul as a soldier, uh, because he will run across explosions. Uh, that's how dedicated to the shoot the man is. Um, but so I was filming it from one direction. Jim was filming it from an opposite direction for his short. So actually that battle scene occurs in both shorts uh, and we, we kind of doubled it up. But that meant that when I turned up on set, as we're about to see here, Jim explained to me what, what was about to happen. And it was ge genuinely one of these things. He'd obviously worked it out with all the pyro guys, but I just turned up kind of thinking, okay, What's going to happen here? And, and this is what we got. Picture this. <laughs> so to our two guys here and here. My guy's here, coward. Your guy's here, and he's like, oh, we're about to fight. Okay. And then we have loads of people rushing past them to go onto the battlefield. Then we go charge, and we all run. And then we, this is where we have our huge battlefield. We've got the tree, two explosions. My guy runs through one, your guy runs through another. We can work out the timings of those in a minute. And then when everybody's over by that building, then a big megaton explosion goes off. And then the building all lights up and smoke starts coming out of it. And they've also got Roman candles that fire, like choo choo choo, that sort of thing. Sounds fucking terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, okay, uh, we're moving to. There's those of you familiar with the alphabet may have worked out. We're heading towards uh, the end of today's thing. I never know what to call these things, but it's, it's the thing, and thank you all for attending this thing. Um, one of the things talking about problems that I think is really, really important to, to stress is that problems are your friends. Ultimately, problems are your friends. Um, one of the only reasons that a stupid movie that we made um, back in 2004 ended up getting distributed in Blockbuster, which back at the time was the main way that movies were distributed. The reason that this movie that we shot in basically a, a large shed in Shoebury uh, ended up getting distributed was because there were hardly any, horror, hardly any British horror movies at the time. We embraced these difficulties, we, uh, and that's the only reason that our movie got made. It's the only reason that our movie met the public, certainly. We embraced the difficulties. Uh, and in that year, this, this information comes from MJ Simpson, who uh, is one of the real kind of gurus of knowing what's up with the uh, British horror scene. He, he's written books on the subject. And, uh, and he's been tracking the amount of commercially released British movies uh, within the genre that happen every year. And at the point Trash House came out, there were 16 commercially released uh, British horror movies that year. Uh, of which we were one of them. Um, by the time Killer Killer came out, which was in 07, there were 18 commercially released British horror movies that year. And again, that worked massively in our favour in terms of getting attention, in terms of having people care about us. Um, by the time Hellbride came out, now Hellbride was shot back to back with Killer Killer, that very busy summer of 2006. Uh, we shot the two movies back to back. Hellbride took longer to uh, complete post-production. It had more special effects work. We had some pacing problems that it took a while to sort out. And by the time Hellbride actually made its way out on DVD, there were 39 British horror movies released that year. So well over double the figure that we were dealing with at the point Trash House came out. By the time our movie The Devil's Music, which is a pucker movie, by the way, very proud of The Devil's Music, uh, there's the new DVD version of it, which I will now plug God damn it. Um, again, from the wonderful folks at Cine Demond, Steve Kirkham, thank you very much. Um, uh, the director's cut of The Devil's Music is coming out soon. But by the time that hit DVD at all, the original cut of it, um, we shot that in 2007. It didn't actually hit DVD until 2010. By that time, there were 64 uh, British horror movies commercially released that year. By the time we got our Death Tales movies out onto the market, 79 British horror movies commercially released that year. But the marketplace is absolutely full, absolutely loaded. I hope I've got the figure right. 30,800 films in production at the moment. 30,800 films is in that production. Just in the UK? That's not just in the UK, no. That's, according, that's what the uh, IMDb has listed as feature films in production. 30,800. So all of a sudden, 
this this marketplace. It's not so you know. I'm not comparing the statistics of sixty. That's within British horror commercially released. But thirty thousand eight hundred is an astonishing amount of movies. Um, and of course, there's only so many releases that the market will actually bear. There's only so many movies that can be taken to commercial release because it hits saturation and everything gets kind of devalued. So my my only kind of ongoing thing from what we've been saying is embrace the problems. Any of you who uh, are filmmakers or want to be filmmakers or anything like that, the things that scare you, the things that freak you out, and the things that are reasons not to do stuff, whether it's weather, whether it's psycho actors, whether it's meat, whatever the hell it is, run towards it and embrace it. Because if you're overcoming obstacles, it's really easy to make a really shit film now. It really is. And if you're overcoming obstacles then hopefully you're overcoming stuff that hurdles other people fall at. So if you aim really big, um, then hopefully you can still make it out into the marketplace. It's an incredibly exciting time to be a filmmaker, but there's so much competition, it's quite terrifying. Um, and that brings us back, um, finally, to what I said at the beginning in terms of the summer of 2006, when my dear, dear friend Al Ronald accidentally trod on the cable. Uh, it, it was my fault the cable was there as well. Um, ultimately, we were running, we were trying to power up the battery while filming. As I said, we only had this one camera. Um, and so it was my fault the cable was there, but we were ultimately left with um, all of our cast, all of our crew, everybody. And we knew that we'd only have them that day. They could stay for as long as they could that day, but we only had seven minutes of power left in that camera before that camera went. We had about 25 setups. Uh, that we intended to do uh, and what we actually did was um, we just rolled the camera for the eight minutes this is the final eight minutes of battery there is a shot there at which point obviously everybody moves back into place we punch in for a close-up on the wound we get Bev in there with some blood Bev, we're in the blood thank you um, Squirts the blood. This is all while we are losing our seven minutes and we are trying to get our, our uh, setups done. I think I used part of that bit of Ollie actually just making the face. I think that shot's in there, that shot's certainly in there. We just rolled the camera, frame, shot, move, frame, shot, move. We shot his tragic death scene, his discussion with his doomed fiance, all of this stuff. We we're basically just going, right, go, frame, shot, move. And we we're grabbing all of these things. Ultimately, we didn't have time to move lights. We didn't have time. We very nearly, hang on, any second now, we'll see a boom, uh, the boom shadow that was the bane of this final sequence. But ultimately, ultimately, again, the camera has now been rolling a minute, tops. We've already had four shots that ended up in the final feature. Um, and these, this was ultimately how we shot all of those final bits that made it into the film and that the film got released. Now, that is not to say that that's a smart way of doing things. That's not to say that in an ideal world you should shoot 25 setups in seven minutes without ever stopping the bloody camera. <laughs> that is not a smart way of doing things. But it's what made the difference between the film being made and not being made. So it's exactly the kind of obstacle that I have learned to love as the years have gone by. Um, I'd like thanks to Paul Cousins uh, for his bit. If we could have a round of applause for Paul, please. And for MJ, and for Danny, and for all our wonderful filmmakers who contributed off the thing. Um, and thank you all ever so much for turning up. My name is Pat Higgins, and my conscience is clear, as always. Yes.